In this first week of the course, I'm going to review analytic geometry. I hope this material is familiar to you from your high school mathematics, though maybe not with the label of analytic geometry. But it is worth reviewing for a couple of reasons. First, analytic geometry is the way that we visualize functions, so all of the images in this course are based on it. Second, there are a variety of different terms and notations for this geometry. This review will clarify my terms and notations so that you are prepared for how I will talk about geometry for the rest of the course. Analytic geometry starts with the Cartesian plane. This is the familiar two-dimensional flat space described by two axes, the horizontal x-axis with the positive pointing right, and the vertical y-axis with the positive pointing up. Then, any point in the plane can be described by its coordinates. The coordinates are two numbers, a and b, put in a notation with parentheses. The point AB is the point you reach by moving A units in the positive X direction, right, and B units in the positive Y direction, up. This coordinate is relative to a fixed starting point. The starting point has the coordinates 0, 0 and is called the origin. I can think of the axes of the Cartesian plane as two real number lines, one in the horizontal direction and one in the vertical direction. The usual symbol used in academic mathematics for the real number lines is an uppercase R with the vertical line doubled as shown here. Since the Cartesian plane is two of these, it's written with a superscript 2. I will often call the Cartesian plane simply R2. I could go on. Cartesian space in three dimensions is R3. Finally, an amazing fact about the Cartesian space is that, mathematically, I can still keep going. Two and three dimensional spaces are the usual geometry that we live in, but in mathematics, I can work in any dimension. I can define R4, R5, any Rn if I want. We're not going to deal with these higher dimensions in this course but it's worth pointing out how versatile and powerful this language is. In the Cartesian plane, geometry can be understood via coordinates. Since each point has numbers assigned to it, coordinates, I can use those coordinates in equations. This is the real power of the system, and the real reason that it was such an immense breakthrough in mathematics when it was defined in the 16th and 17th century. If I use the variables an x and y for the coordinates, which is usual, then any equation in x and y corresponds to the coordinates that satisfy the equation. This correspondence is the heart of analytic geometry. Take the circle. The equation for the unit circle is x squared plus y squared equals 1. The familiar shape matches that equation because each point on that shape and no other points has coordinates that match the equation. In the figure, I've shown three such points, and you can check that if you square both coordinates and add them up, you do in fact get one. The circle is called the locus of the equation. A locus is a name for this construction. Any equation in x and y has a shape associated to it called its locus, and the plural of locus is loci. Here are some more examples of loci. This diagram shows the locus of y squared minus x equals 0. The locus of xy equals 1 has two parts, one in the first quadrant and one in the third. Finally, the locus of x over y equals 1 is a straight line, though it excludes the origin, since that would lead to the undefined expression 0 over 0. For the purposes of this course, Analytic geometry is most useful for giving a picture of a function. I'll review functions properly in the second week, but for now, a graph of a function is a picture of that function in the Cartesian plane. Here are some graphs of functions that you might recognize. First, the graph of an exponential function, in this case, e to the x over 5 plus 1 half. Also here is the graph of a cubic function, in this case, x cubed over 7. Here's also a graph of a sine function, and finally, a graph of a linear function, in this case, y equals negative x. Since each x value only leads to one output of a function, you can recognize graphs of functions by what is called a vertical line test. 
This means that any vertical line can only cross the graph of a function at most once. You will see in the diagram here that any vertical line I draw will only cross each function once, no matter where I draw that vertical line.